My name is Laura Tunyus. I am the founder and CEO of Corux. We're a, a Munich-based company operating from Munich and Boston, um, approximately one and a half years old. So we're learning to walk now. We're in the toddler age and we're 20 people. Um, and we have prescribed ourselves to the mission of making civil engineering and really the, the dirty groundwork in our more horizontal construction sites more efficient by seizing the readily available data of construction vehicles. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the scars on my still young analytics back and the workflow we have adopted in order to enable you and our existing customers to really get um, working with more sophisticated data models. I do see that my fonts are not embedded, so usually we do have a little bit of a better design, but um, you can just check that out when you're working with our product in person. Um, so why are we doing this? We heard of DevOps before. We have pressing needs that are really forcing our industry to act. We need to change. And we mentioned some of the McKinsey figures, which I also never failed to mention because they are impressive before, that we are employing a vast majority of our work workforce, meaning that we need to find out how we can bridge the knowledge transfer from those who yield massive expertise that have been in our industry for 40, 50 years, and those newbies my age coming into the workforce and who are completely prone to checking their Fitbit as to how long they've slept, who communicate with WhatsApp, so who have this consumerization running through their veins, and then they come to their job and that's where it hits them. They can't find their excavator. This stri strikes me every time when I'm onboarding a new customer and I'm saying, okay, yeah, let's, let's work together. Can you send me your machine list? Yeah, <laughs> sure, give me a week. And it takes them a week to fully collaborate their extensive list of machines, their approximate whereabouts, and how many operating hours they have. And this should not be the norm of our industry since it's not only the people factor that it's, that's at stake, but also the environmental one, and that directly goes into play with your profitability and our industries. So if we keep wasting the resources that are at stake, we're um, putting our planet at risk, but also our own balance sheets. And this is where Corex comes into play, that we focused on which is really the s sector within the construction industry or the area which can yield tangible benefit in a very graspable time frame. And as Leerke mentioned before, um, I like the smell of asphalt because my mom kindly put me in a stroller on the job site as of day two. So I come from a family of construction engineers, uh, mom being a civil surveyor working on heavy infrastructure projects. And my dad was an architect, meaning that I came accustomed to the typical problems because they were always discussed at dinner when I was dragged into the construction site, it's always the same. You're debating in claim management as to what could have improved and how you could have gone away from the prototype thinking. But these waves of digitization flooded other industries, but ours. And Quark said, we need to be focused. We can't invent the Holy Grail and maybe write a revision of the Testament all in one, but we need to do something that's actually practical. And we focused on really the layer where work happens, where there's a high delta between inefficiency and efficiency, since these are in unpredictable processes, and um, you have readily available data. Since there are machines operating, which are far more intelligent than um, many would think, and we just can unleash this information there. Data comes into play that it then spans across all these phases. Yes, AI will disrupt the entire supply chain and we will be gathering certain parts of data fragments that then form a picture of the entirety of the job site. So if you look at what data you might be able to collaborate, it spans from planning data to actual usage data, and that can refeed into your BIM models to make them more productive. And there also lies the potential of different mechanisms of gathering this data. We touched upon things like 
digital twins before and using robotics and then also maybe using a certain type of asset monitoring already in the procurement. So touching upon factors of logistics to form this consolidated data overview. And we focus on really the growing number of data that's arising from these IoT devices. Massive numbers in all of our industries, billions, trillions. I didn't even know the word trillion before coming into this industry. And then we're seeing, okay, what can we actually collaborate this to come to a tangible outcome? And in our view, in order to increase uptime, since that's the, the term we like to coin it, we're trying to make our users more effective, thereby increasing their uptime instead of not only just preventing the causes of downtime, but really making them more efficient in their workflow, we collaborate IoT and process data together from machines and revolving activities around it. So ERP systems, um, different types of financial accounting systems, and all collaborating that into one data platform where the user can have a seamless interaction with what is currently happening on his job site. And that actually brings me to the scars on my analytics back. We set out into our Quarx journey with a massively cool predictive case. One of our first projects for one of the largest construction companies in the world, we were able to predict downtime by three months with an accuracy of 89%. That was massive. We thought, my God, Google, bye-bye. This is gonna be easy. And then we faced the bare truth of data availability. Data is not available in the quality that you need in order to do these sophisticated analytics. This was present because that database had been collecting highly detailed vehicle data for 25 years. And that's where, when we pinpointed a part of that pool, we got this accuracy of 89% um, that made us all jump with joy. But it's not that easy. And that brings me to our process that we take with our customers in order to find a way to really get him to a more re a predictive and prescriptive approach in handling his operations. And that starts with the industrial asset. Typically, we have a fleet which ranges between two and 20 years of our customers. So there's a high heterogeneity in there, not just in the age of machines, but also in the type of OEMs. And dear OEMs, that's probably not going to change. It will remain heterogeneous. And that is not a bad thing because it allows us to actually find collaborative modes to maybe use the factors that we are strong at, but get support in the factors that we might be suffering from a little. And our customer has the complexity of finding a solution to come across this cro across OEM solution, which fits with his budget, but also his implementation time. I think the, the study that was aforementioned with the, with the aversion that people face to technology in terms of implementation is one that has been handled exceptionally well by track unit as well, by looking at um, how can you really find a hardware solution or a, t a means of data acquisition that is implementation easy. And that's where we rely on partners, but also our own development or co-development in looking at what are the different assets requiring from a hardware perspective. And that's the first step that is taken. When doing that, we also define either together with the OEM or the supplier, what data really needs to be extracted. We don't want to just compute for computation's sake, but it needs to be decided what data is actually ingested in which frequency and does this add relevancy to my workflow. At the beginning of one of these examples, when we hit our gold pot of the 89%, we started getting all canned data we could get and we ingested between 80 and 200 gigabytes of data per machine per month. And this obviously made Vodafone and our other technology partners very happy because our consumption was going up and we were placed onto decks and it was all great because Quarox was celebrated. It's, it's great, 80, 100 gigabyte of data flowing in in, in a second frequency, that's awesome. But what does it really mean? I don't need to know every hydraulic measure in a frequency of 10 milliseconds. And that's what we quickly learned with our customers. You need to identify what data is really relevant for the type of application that we're dealing with. And that's where the real-time data extraction comes into play, that we look at which data points actually need to be computed. Um, can some be sent over in a daily basis? And this is where also the work with AMP and different unions in Germany through 
4.0 are coming together to define what are the data standards that apply to a more consolidated view of equipment. Then it comes to really contextualizing the type of data we're dealing with. As mentioned before, we are ingesting data from multiple sources, meaning that today, rental yards and customers are connecting their machine data, their ERP systems, their Microsoft Dynamics, all into Quorox, meaning that we have a bunch of data flowing in and um, need to contextualize this. We need to see how can perhaps maintenance events be brought into context with downtime. And by that, I do not want to call up some of our users on a daily basis and say, did you just kill your machine or what happened there? Because I need to label my data set. And this is something where contextualizing with other sources in a seamless manner is so important because the work environment is already complex enough and we cannot expect the user to continuously tell us why there was downtime, was this downtime planned, or was the 30% idling that was happening yesterday completely normal? And that idling shouldn't have been reduced because the crane had to hold a load or somebody had to hold another process or support a process. And this is where I think being close to the user, understanding the industry is so vastly important. Because our crane customers, if I tell them I'm going to reduce your idling time, they're going to tell me I'm nuts because it's part of their work. They need to be idling and they cannot always just use what maybe a Watson has prescribed, but they need to pair it with industry built rule engines. And that's where our data contextualization and I'd say also part of our largest IP goes, comes into play before then applying predictive models. And predictive models is a big word. Um, it's often just basic statistic. Um, and this is also where we differentiate with the user. We cannot go in and tell the user that we're going to do prescriptive analytics and we're charging him 244,000 because my AI ROI calculator calculated for him. Because if it's something I can solve with prescriptive statistics or simple statistics, this is also something where we weigh off as to what really the most elegant and pragmatic, as I think all of the German adverbs were put on my name tag today, so skeptical and pragmatic, so that's where some of uh, my DNA comes into play. I want to be solving user pains and not adding a pain to my user. And how does this all actually get presented to the user? Because most of our dearest users don't really care about what's happening in our back end, but care about what's being visualized. And that visualization is indeed something that needs to be industry built once again. We, we know the pain of our users that have been confronted with cross OEM solutions um, by perhaps more horizontal IoT providers. Um, we all know some of them, and I am in no position to be doing any calling out as such a young company, but we know that some of these practices are not effective. You need to be looking at a very, very vertically integrated interface that works with your user group. So that doesn't have three tabs and 10 clicks to get to his results, but that he can come to a process documentation within three, three clicks. So exactly the Fitbit type of couleur, bringing that into the business. Easiness and translatability into an environment which does not have time to take a multitude of clicks. And this is where I have to say, looking at the stretch of different steps, this is probably the most consultative in, in the work we do with our customers and that it requires a lot of sparring with the user. And this is mock-up play. This is driving to your user and understanding what he really needs. But this is also where some of the biggest value is created because we see that big cloud competitors are not always able to scale into these industries effectively because they might have a very, very powerful technology, but they might make it too complex to understand. And this is where most of our customers are often overwhelmed because even if they have access to 10 different platforms, they're going to have to find the operating hours in a different platform part each time. And that's where we heavily rely on finding the right mode. At the end of the day, this all needs to have a use as well. So ideally, what Quark's um, 
ends up earning is more than the value that, or is less than the value we, we achieved for the user, meaning that we need to be finding some method of applying cost-saving insights to this. And this, um, in our world, mainly relates to saving costs related to maintenance or um, reducing machine or slowing machine depreciation. So looking at how can you maybe make more use of your full service agreements, how can you really maximize your machine value so that when you, when you think of reselling a machine or when you're thinking of applying a different business model to it, it still has the most value. And there I'm going to go into two small use cases, which, um, in my opinion, one builds up on the other. So operational efficiency is something that can be powered by AI. And this is something when you have the data consistency is quite scalable. And it's actually something that is, in our opinion, one of the use cases we tackle most. So looking at um, getting to a data availability where you're measuring between five to 50 values in a frequency which is adequate and applying models to it by saying, okay, there are certain thresholds when I know my machine is going to experience an issue, when my temperature is over X, when my um, hydraulic oil contamination is more than this, and then you get to an operational efficiency by applying that to different asset groups. Asset groups, this um, bears a word of caution. We also know that the differences within our assets in the construction industry, so the different machines are drastic, meaning that with trying to make a machine more efficient or trying to reduce the fuel usage of a machine, one typically has to also classify by the type of machine. And that's where the cross OEM factor comes into play quite nicely because those OEMs in the room, you can already, already really set out as a differentiator then for the asset group you might be strongest in or the production types that um, are the most winning in your organization. Um, for Corox, this is typically what builds upon the data transparency. So looking at um, first having generated a data pool, which one can collect different values from, um, and then basically see how s certain types of monitoring in order to label the data can be implemented. What we then, as touched upon in the last point of, of our workflow with the user, what we then also focus on really how do you monetize this. So when we work with OEMs, it's a matter of what services can you implement in order to maybe come to a paper use or a usage based model by saying to your user who might have the antiquated view of getting one machine from you after X months of waiting time of the delivery paying that machine and then paying for X amount of services, but really transferring that type of model into the world that's already present in a lot of different industries and looking at um, can the user adopt equipment as a service models or different types of modes of having a servicing wrapped around his one-off purchase. And this doesn't only introduce a new revenue pool to many participants in our industry, but adds a completely new way of interacting with our user. It's similar to the insurance industry that um, we are really getting to know how our piece of equipment is used in day-to-day -day life, meaning that it yields closer con uh, customer context and contact in all ways. Um, and the latter part, um, Ali, Lu alludes more to how can you add performance wrappers and performance guarantees to your machines. So by adding predictability and knowing when your machine is able to fail, you can also either extend warranties of your machines or look at um, how you can add proactive, uh, proactive servicing. So like the Nespresso new user who knows how much coffee is consumed and who proactively sends new um, coffee pads or pods, um, that too can be applied to small spare part management in our industry. And I think we have plenty of opportunity to speak about all of these type of new buzzwordy concepts today um, and also the more real life applications that we're currently handling. So I'm very excited to be here with all of you until tomorrow and look forward to many interesting discussions.